Thanks for joining us on the Globetrotters podcast. This is part two of the We Are All In This Together film story by Daniel Troya. Daniel's story and film is about a seventh month cross-country bicycle journey with the hopes of gaining a better understanding of the human connection. And let me mention, he did this without any food or money. I'm your host, John Otero. And Daniel, let's pick it up from where we last left off. Awesome. Stoked to be here. In part one, if anyone's listening, you know, we really spent most of the conversation talking about the journey, the experience of doing this, what some people will call a once in a lifetime journey. Maybe you have a few more planned in you. Um, but for this next part, I really want to focus on the filmmaking aspect of this because it sounds like, would you consider yourself an amateur filmmaker even at this point? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And And, and I wanted to embrace that. I mean, something I like to share with people is I didn't go to film school. Um, I didn't have much experience before making this this film. Um, I just kind of went out there and just just went for it, if that makes sense. And mm -hmm. I was learning on the road, like how to set up specific shots and especially the drone. I didn't really know how to use the drone. So I was learning on the fly. And Shit. I'd love to share with people that, I mean, sometimes we have ideas and that, that voice in our head says, no, like that won't be any good or, or you'll fail or why even try? And I would encourage people to shut off that voice and just believe in yourself and just go for it because you, ne you never know what could happen from it. You know, and transitioning from traveler to filmmaker is a significant evolution. Um, but what inspired you to document your journey and share it with others? Because it's different than just living it, right? Yeah, yeah, I definitely wanted to show because when you're on a bike, there's just really unique things that happen. And there's there's moments like if you're traveling across the country in a car, you're just not exposed to the same things as if if you're on a bicycle riding through communities. And the interesting thing is that as I knew that because I'd done a couple bike tours before this one. And um, I noticed that when people see your bags and your, your sleeping bags and your loaded down bike and you might be looking like you've been riding a lot, people are curious about your story. So it attracts attention. And so I knew that by being on a bicycle, it was going to give me this unique opportunity to connect with people. And so, and so that's why I wanted to film it because I thought it was, um, kind of given a perspective that most people don't see or experience. I know you met a you met a cyclist going from I think they were doing New York the way back, but you met him in Virginia. Did you meet other people in different legs of your journey that were also kind of cycling, maybe not across the country, but at least across the state or city or something like that? I did actually, and that was one thing that was kind of I was torn on what to do because when I was in Nevada, I met like three cyclists who were traveling in the same direction as me. I think they were going to like St. Louis or something and they invited me to continue riding with them. But I, I felt like I needed to stay alone for the yeah. sake of the documentary. And that was one thing that was, it was kind of a tough decision. It was the right decision for sure. But I did miss on, 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 on like travel moments like that, where I could have just ridden with some cool people for a couple of days. Yeah. And, and on the top of that, right, like security, safety, where you might feel a little bit more comfortable going in this group and tackling the adventure together. But yeah, I think, I mean, I applaud you for it because I think it's a lot of people out there would have taken that security blanket versus, you know, maybe staying true to the film and the authenticity of your experience and doing it alone and, and tackling it that way. Yeah, thank you for saying that, acknowledging that. It definitely was a tough decision, but I think it was the right one. Yeah, I agree. Um, so throughout the production of We Are All In This Together, what were some of the toughest decisions you had to make to capture your journey authentically outside of what we just discussed? Huh. Um, I mean, the camera glasses were super tricky because the camera glasses, like I didn't realize how much we move our heads when we talk until I had camera glasses on and I reviewed the footage. <laughs> so like, you know, in post-production, I had to, I had to invest in some like stabilizer programs mm -hmm. to really give it some, you know, make it look make it look good. And so people didn't get sick watching the, you know, get dizzy watching how shaky it could be. So that was the logistics behind that was tough. You know, the funny thing was, is I had a camera right here on the, on the glasses and there was only one person out of hundreds of people that I met that said, are those camera glasses? That's what and I it was, was actually ask. like, yeah, there, it was actually like, I stopped on a college campus in like the third day. I didn't, I was, didn't know really have a flow of what I was doing yet. So I just started stopping in random places and trying to panhandle, et cetera. And, and they noticed it, but, um, I wore a helmet 
uh, you know, when I was talking to people and that kind of hid like the camera glasses even, even more. So that was one aspect of it. How did people respond to being, I guess, being filmed during the conversation? Because obviously I know you disclose afterwards, like, hey, this is a document or sorry, this is a film. And, um, you know, do you want to be on camera, the, all the waivers, all that? Or how did you navigate that actually? Yeah. So um, everybody or there was only like, I think maybe like three or four people who declined um, to be in the film. And, and that's because they just shared some personal things. But the thing was, is most people, I'd say 99% of people were very supportive of it because it was showing them doing a kind act, right? Helping someone. So they knew like, okay, yeah, it's just showing me like being a good Samaritan. Like I'm cool with you using this footage, you know? And so, yeah, I'm not even sure if it was me. If, if I was the one being filmed, I'm not sure if I'd want to be in the movie even. So yeah. it's kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. And that's why I asked because I think, yeah. you know, you are a stranger at the end of the day, whether you have this interesting conversation with them and like touching moment with them, but you're still a stranger. It's like, I don't really know what the purpose of this film really is or what angle he's going to approach it from. Like, I'm not sure I want to put my face and, you know, voice and endorsement behind it. So I get it. That's a real... Yeah, that's a really great point. And, and what I did was I, I sent, um, before I the film came out and people signed the waivers, et cetera, I, I, I sent them like a video clip of what the footage was so they knew exactly how they were going to ah, be appearing cool. in the in the movie. So. And I'm yeah. assuming no objections there either, right? No, they, everybody was, was, was happy to be in it, yeah. And so you, you talk about like having to invest in like this software to stabilize the the, the footage that you captured from your glasses, but I got to imagine that there's other logistical challenges that you were maybe not prepared for when you took off. What were yeah. Like this, the sound quality is something I wish like I could have. And again, I'm, I'm happy with how it turned out, but yeah. um, like there wasn't anywhere to like put a microphone, you know, like, you know, the camera, the microphones in these glasses or whatever. Right. Or on my GoPro. And so that's something I just, that made it challenging for me. And, and also charging my gear like um i would stop usually like every three or four days at a, at a library to charge my gear but it'd be a bummer sometimes like if i was in a beautiful area and i wanted to break up my drone but i just didn't have enough time to charge the drone or something like that so that was challenging and any issues with you ever getting inside one of the libraries like you know maybe or was it all pretty accessible yeah, people were usually, yeah, it was accessible and supportive. And I, I did, you know, I will say again, like as time went on um, and my appearance was changing, I, I felt like the employees were checking out, checking on me more often just to make sure I wasn't just like hanging out there all day. And they wanted to make sure that I was like using the library for, for work. But yeah, overall, it was okay. And so what, I mean, dude, I'm you're cycling so many miles. I think, the, how, how much weight are you carrying with the drone? GoPro's minimal weight, but I got to assume that's like, what, 10, 15 pounds total? So the drone itself was like, because I had like five batteries with it, because this is an older drone that like, um, yeah, the battery life wasn't super strong, et cetera, and it was a bigger drone. And now that you can fit them in your pocket, it's amazing, right? And um, But total gear, I, I was almost carrying like 60 pounds of gear. Wow. With like, it was crazy with like all my camera gear, my cooking equipment, my tent, my sleeping bag toiletries uh bike maintenance stuff clothes all of that i mean it was way more than i normally would bring on a bike tour usually when i'm on bike touring and if i'm not making a movie i'm carrying maybe 40 pounds of gear which is still a lot but i mean even the slightest hill like you really feel it when you're carrying 60 pounds of gear was there ever a point while you're cycling that you're thinking like maybe i should just get rid of some of this weight <laughs> I mean, I wanted to with the clothes, especially. Thankfully, I didn't, especially when I was in Montana and I need to be wearing those clothes. But yeah, at first I thought I was bringing too many clothes. But even then, that wouldn't be, it was mostly just the film stuff that was like really weighing me down. Your film beautifully captures the highs and lows of your journey. How did you navigate those moments of vulnerability and discomfort while staying true to your storytelling vision? Yeah, it was tough. It was tough at times because I realized like I'm having a real life moment with somebody and, and, and then trying to also be, be aware of like where I was standing and making sure I was like standing in a way that was capturing the moment with my camera glasses. It was, it was difficult. And I mean, there's one story that comes to mind when um, one of the most impactful moments of the whole experience was when I was riding through East St. Louis. And um, again, it was in a neighborhood that where there was a lot of crime and drugs and gangs. So I, I had my, 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 
all my footage like in my underwear I was I was I was riding and I didn't want to break out my camera for you know didn't want to be filming this in a, in, a, yeah, yeah, in an yeah. area where I get, might get my stuff stolen and this man like yells at me from across the street and he's like he's like hey bro he's like what are you doing in this neighborhood and he came up and started talking to me and his name was Harold and Harold was 24 years old and um he just got out of prison he served a, a six-year prison sentence and his clothes were all in tatters and he um, just started sharing his life story with me within a couple of minutes. And um, at one point he was sobbing, crying on my shoulder and talking about how he's terrified to go at sleep at night under a bridge because of what happened to him in prison. He was traumatized and he lifted up his shirt and he showed me this scar he had from his chest down to below his stomach from when someone stabbed him in prison. Right. And again, he was 24 years old and I'll never forget what he said to me before, you know, I said goodbye. It was, he said, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be around for. And it made me think about like when I was 24 years old, like I had so many opportunities. I was backpacking around Europe. I was in college and and this guy was talking like his life was already over. And I'm, I'm sharing that story because it, it was so incredibly impactful. And it was also one where I, I wish I was able to capture it too. But in the end, as far as filming wise, you know, but in the end, I, I think that I still have that like story in my heart and I'll never forget meeting Harold and he changed my life. And, um, but I'm just, that's kind of an example of balancing between I'm having this real life experience, but at the same time I am a filmmaker and I'm, I'm noticing that this is a super impactful story that could be, you know, shared with others. Yeah. You know, we've had some people on the podcast that have been in like war, they've been like war correspondents or, you know, photojournalists in war zones. And it's like, we always ask that question, you know, like, how do you navigate that, like, fine line between documenting it, because it's kind of what you're supposed to do. And like, you know, these are authentic moments and being respectful of that person's like, you know, vulnerability. And um, yeah, I don't know if there is an answer. Yeah, I hear you. And you know, what's funny is, because um, I was like, kind of halfway in halfway out with certain situations, like when I went through East St. Louis, when I rode through there, where again, there's just a lot of crime and drugs, unfortunately, and a lot of lack of opportunity. I didn't break out my camera very much because I felt like in some ways it was going to be like disrespectful and like, in a way, like exploiting like their hardships for like a film, mm -hmm. you know? And I saw, so I was torn on what to do with that, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, looking ahead, what do you hope viewers will take away from watching We Are All In This Together? And how do you envision your film inspiring positive change or dialogue? Yeah, I hope that more than anything, I hope that people see it and just want to treat each other better. I mean, there's been some really super beautiful moments of like people sharing feedback with me, whether, you know, people saw it, you know, on the streaming platforms and they'll send me an email or at film festivals, people will come up to me and, and share stories or... It's really beautiful. I mean, even just a couple of weeks ago, there was a a person I met who and she, she had recently lost her mom, um, like, you know, and then within a couple of days, she just happened to come across my film. And she said that watching the film was gave her some peace and some happiness and helping her you know, with the grieving process, et cetera. And that's just like the biggest compliment I can ever, you know, receive. And I'm so grateful to be able to, sh to share this movie with people. And I mean, if, if, if it's, if people feel anything from it you know feel hope or happiness or that just may, means the world to me so i would love it if overall people wanted just to treat each other better and, and show up for each other yeah have you been surprised at the reception that your film has received um or has it ex exceeded your wildest expectations not sure where you stand on that yeah i really appreciate you asking the the, the, the question john and i'm going to answer honestly and it's going to um from the moment that I came up, this idea came into my head, it felt like I was more sure of this one thing than anything in my entire life. And I wouldn't say, I wouldn't really consider myself very spiritual, but this entire journey, like everything that happened along the way, while I was on the road, etc., when the hardships would happen, the desert, the mountains, like the people I came across, it all felt like it was like playing out exactly how it was supposed to. Mm -hmm. So it's I've been very fortunate to receive like a good amount of recognition at film festivals etc and the cool thing about that is it's not like it's not this like individual achievement it's it's the people that came into my life during while filming you know this documentary like they created this story and it's this collaboration and what's really beautiful is 
um, you know, the theme of the movie is togetherness. And to make this movie, we needed to work together, you know, as, you know, um, and collaborate. And uh, so I wouldn't say that it's a surprise to see it because it felt like it was all supposed to happen. And the people that I met were so, their acts of kindness were so beautiful and uh, meaningful. So I felt like I, I definitely had a feeling it was going to resonate with some people. And again, giving all the credit to the people I met, they're the ones that created this story. Yeah, no, no doubt. And then kind of switching a little bit to the more technical side of things. If you were your harshest critic or whoever it is that, you know, you, you look up to or is a mentor to you in in the filmmaking process, I, I don't know anything about filmmaking. Like what, what would you have done differently in terms of like, you know, maybe angles? Uh, I don't really know what I'm talking about. Yeah, no, no problem. And I, I would have, I just would have filmed way more, even though I had hundreds and hundreds of hours of footage. I just think there was still a lot of opportunities where I could have just filmed more of the lifestyle I was living. Um, things like that. Um, yeah, because um, the angles and stuff, I think is whenever you're making a film, that'll always happen. But there's just, I realized that there was just a lot more opportunities to film more of the lifestyle that I was living. And um, that's something I, th I thought about for sure. And were there ever moments where you have to like place, like let's say the GoPro, place it somewhere, you're filming yourself and then you have to walk back to like get it kind of, I don't know if you've ever seen Survivor Man in which Les yeah. has to do that all the time, right? He's filming himself hunting, but he has to go back and forth for his equipment. Yeah, I did that with the GoPro for sure. I didn't do it in the mountains too often because I didn't want to have to ride back up the mountain. You know? <laughs> so that's something I would prefer to use my drone out, drone out there. But yeah, I definitely had, had moments like that where I would set up the camera. And I mean, and just kind of touching on that a little more, I mean, I was uncomfortable with putting myself into the story. And so that's why I, I was saying that there was moments I wish I would have filmed more in regards to the lifestyle. But I just felt like there was an important story to tell. And I didn't want to, I felt so self-conscious about being on camera, et cetera. And then once I got back and started editing the movie, I realized that that was, that's an important part because it's showing how these interactions are shaping my perspective of humanity, et cetera. But there's, there's been a level of discomfort, not just with making the film, but also with it being out there now of like me, um, I, I've always been anonymous. And now like this, this, this film that I made is like available for people to watch. And there's a little bit of discomfort because in the movie, I talk about some of my vulnerabilities, and at one part, part I, I cry, like, and it's like that's just uncomfortable to be out there in that way. Yeah, no, I hear you. I and again, I can empathize. Have have there for all the positive, um, you know, criticism. No, for all the positive support you've received for this film, has there been any backlash about you trying to like live this lifestyle when? You know, you come from a place of, of opportunity and privilege, if we want to label it that way. Oh, I'm so happy you brought that up. And yeah, definitely. And that's why, and I, and I want to talk about that. That's like the, the very, at the very beginning of the movie, yeah. the first thing you see is me acknowledging the privilege that I have to go and do this because that's super important to talk about. Um, and there's people who haven't seen the movie who maybe they'll read a headline and, and talk about the privileges, et cetera. Like, um, but I, I just encourage them, Hey, check out the movie. Like I, that plays a role in the movie. I, I acknowledge the privileges I have. And, um, and again, it's, it's a really important conversation to have because in some ways my privileges or not some ways, my privileges did allow me to go and and put myself in these vulnerable positions. But at the same time, I think it allowed me to show some beautiful interactions with people that wouldn't have happened if I didn't have these privileges. Yeah, no, I agree. It makes sense. Um, and then kind of last question about, you know, technical aspects of the film, the soundtrack. I, if anyone listened to part one and is now listening to part two, go back to the beginning of part one. I start off this conversation by saying the soundtrack is banging. Um, who, who helped you? How do you, how do you figure out what music is the best for a certain scene and like getting the right, um, oomph for that scene? Yeah, I appreciate you bringing it up. So the soundtrack is by an Alaskan band called Portugal The Man. And um, they're my favorite band. I've been listening to them for like more than 10 years. And they're just so socially active. You know, they're they're always raising money for different different social causes. And, and their activism, I love it. And, you know, their activism, the reason I chose their music for the film is because I think it really fits with the themes that show up in the film. 
right? And when I listen to their music, it makes me want to be, you know, socially active. And I was so stoked to use it. And what happened was I, I met them before, before I made the documentary, I went up to one of their shows and I met the lead singer. His name is John Gurley. He's doing amazing things, amazing things. And um, as far as raising money for different, yeah. you know, activism campaigns and bringing awareness to a lot of important social issues. And, and I, 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 I shared with them, I said, Hey man, I have this idea for this documentary. I said, do you think it'd be cool if like I could use the music? And he said, um, yeah, just give me just like, I'll take down your info. And just, he said, like, just let me know when you're done with the film and then we can work something out. And, and I, I finished the, you know, the film and sent it to them and they're on board. And I feel so grateful because again, like I'd, I'd highly recommend anybody listen to this podcast, check out Portugal, the man, they are doing such amazing things with, with changing the world with their activism. And it's so inspiring because these are just a lot, like they describe it as they're just Alaskan kids, you know, and now they have this like really awesome platform and, and they're spreading awareness about such important causes and seeing them do it makes me think, well, shoot, man, like I could probably just do the same thing, you know, and all of us can, you know, it's so it's super inspiring to have their music in the film. Hey, man, through watching your film, they got another fan in me because I, I really did awesome. enjoy the music. Um, cool, man. Daniel, as you continue your journey as a filmmaker and storyteller, what new projects or collaborations are you eager to explore? And how do you plan on continuing to amplify these voices and stories that resonate with themes of unity and compassion? Yeah, so I love the question. Um, so what I'm doing for this, the rest of this year is um, I'm going to be having live showings of my film, We're All In This Together. And um, so basically... I rent out a different theater in different cities across the country and a hundred percent of the ticket sales go to the local homeless shelter. Mm. Right. And so that's really fun to, to connect with people in their communities and share the, the message of the movie and raise money for shelters. So I'm going to spend the next year doing that. And then my next film is planning. I'm planning on doing is I want to ride across South America. And as of right now, the idea is I want to make a, a film about compassion and gratitude you know, and I would love to ride across those countries and connect with people who are living in, 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 in different cultures and learn about their culture and learn and hear their stories. Right. And again, it's just kind of a continuation of just connecting with people who are different and showing that there's more that brings us together than what separates us. Yeah, man, I love that. And if you ever make it down to Austin for one of your screenings, let me know. Would definitely love to go and support that uh, 100%. And when it comes to your journey of like cycling across Latin America, I'm all for it, man. That sounds amazing. Thank you. I appreciate it. And Austin, I've been there. It's got a really great cycling culture. So that's definitely one of the, the, the places that's on my list of, you know, to show the film live. Oh, yeah, man. Let me know. You'll you'll get me cool. out there. And so before we run out of time, we want to get into our last segment, which is a rapid fire segment. We're going to ask you five questions in quick succession. Answer as quickly as you can. Are you ready? Ready. All right. Smallest city that surprised you on your journey, for better or worse? Smallest city. Um, yeah, I think it was called Alexander in Kansas. And I, I want to say literally the population was like 13. And when I, when I rode through there, when I rode through there, somebody stopped and gave me a bottle of water. So uh, I, I thought you were going to say you rode in and you rode out and that was it. Like one street. <laughs> well, that's yeah yeah <laughs> that's awesome right longest stretch you went without food or and water both yeah so i mean the longest stretch i went without the water aspect was in the desert when i was uh when i ran out of water and that was the 35 miles but that's in a desert so i was definitely feeling the need for thirst there the interesting about the food man is again based on i was in this unique situation with a with a with an interesting sign and the dumpster diving i didn't go a day without eating I was oh, very fortunate. That's actually mm -hmm. really surprising. Wasn't expecting yeah. that. Um, mm -hmm. Longest stretch without a shower. Oh, man. Yeah, that's a tough one. And not one I'm proud of, but I want to say it was like six days. And that's like six days in like 90 degree heat in Utah. So like that was not pleasant to be in at all. <laughs> um, I, like I was always on the lookout for rivers and I jumped in a river any chance I could get. But like, in you know. In the sandstone canyons in, in Utah, there wasn't a lot of opportunities to bathe. And I mean, I brought baby wipes with me and I would just kind of hit the main areas of my body before I'd go to bed. But I definitely did not feel fresh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the most wildlife you saw, any any particular stuff? 
Yeah, Colorado. I saw a couple of bears out there in Colorado, oh, and that, that was really awesome. Yeah, on the side of the road. Really, really cool to see the bears. Yeah. was not expecting that, but very cool. Um, and then last question, would you do this again? I, I definitely would do more bike tours, but I would never go again without food or money. Um, I do think that when I came back from the, from the trip that I definitely needed to recover, not just physically, but mentally, like it, it wore on me in ways that I don't think was good for my mental health. Um, and again, I was so privileged to be able to do this in the first place, but that strain that I was feeling towards the end, like I was a very different person when I got back than, than when I left. And it took me a while to kind of feel like my mental health was back in a, in a, in a place that it needed to be. So I wouldn't do that aspect again. Yeah, man. I, I, in so many ways, it's kind of a mind fuck too, because you come back with a new perspective and you see all this, like people having these things and all these privileges that maybe other people in other parts of the country don't have. And yeah, just, just the whole thing really. But um, Daniel, I just want to thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast. I've learned a lot about you. I've been inspired through this conversation and I know for a fact people listening will be too. So if our listeners want to learn a little bit more about you, where can they find you? Yeah. So um, I'd say if you want to learn more about the film, go to we are all in this together movie dot com and um obviously you can see the movie on um, amazon prime apple tv and google play and then if you'd like to keep up um i'm putting out another film on my youtube channel um this spring i, I rode across europe last summer and i made a movie um called the child within and that the theme of that movie is finding the thing that makes you feel like a child again and for me it's it's riding my bike so for that movie I rode across Europe and uh, my YouTube channel is called The Travelin' No G. So The Travelin' Dude. And uh, the same with my Instagram. It's The underscore Travelin' underscore Dude. Awesome. And you can find out a little bit more about us by visiting our website at www.gtspodcast.com. You can find us on Instagram or Facebook at Globetrotters Podcast, Twitter at Globetrot Pod. Make sure you drop us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify if you enjoyed listening to this conversation. Editing on this podcast was done by myself and to Daniel and our guests. Until next time.